Today is November 25th, 2009, and I'm at the home of Arnold Yellen, and we're going to do an oral interview for the archives of the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. Julian Reitman is the camera operator, and I have the privilege to now today of speaking with Arnold about his thoughts and memories of growing up and being in business in Stanford. When you were in grade school or Willard School or Stanford High School, did you find any overt anti-Semitism while you were a student? I think every uh, Jewish child in this community uh, faced up to it at one time or another going through uh, school. Um, because you were tagged as soon as the Jewish holidays came and you weren't in school. This is before schools took off for the uh, yeah, for everybody on the Jewish holiday. Uh, where is Arnold Yellen? Uh, well, it's a Jewish holiday. He's Jewish, and uh, and and you hear remarks. Uh, I was not at any time uh, uh, put through a uh, very traumatic other than the fact uh, that uh, I was told that they knew I was Jewish and every once in a while uh, a blurb would come out uh, about uh, your being Jewish and uh, but I was lucky to grow up uh, with friends that uh, were under understood equalities and they had their own uh, problems. Uh, the Franklin School neighborhood was uh, uh, predominantly, or I would say at least 50% black. And uh, so I think people were more tolerant, or were becoming more tolerant at that point. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, when you finished high school, what was your next step in your lifetime? Well, I've had, uh, thankfully, a very uh, unique uh, <laughs> life history. Um, I didn't uh, go on to college. I went directly to work in my father's business, who I didn't know. I, I'll go back a couple of years. My father was in the insurance business with the Prudential Insurance Company for 20 years. And in the mid-40s, uh, he was doing photography as a hobby. And the hobby became so big uh, that he left the insurance company and became a photographer full-time. And the uh, studio is still intact today, uh, run by my son, Robert. Uh, uh, the photography business uh, got to a, such a point that he had to decide on whether he should be an insurance man or a photographer. Well, he stayed doing both for a short period of time, and that is the reason that the name of the studio became Hay Photographers or Hay Photo Service. He just didn't want to mix up Mr. Yellen, the insurance man, with Mr. Yellen, the photographer. What was the acronym Hay? Where did he come with, up with that? Well, I, the name of uh, Hay came out of uh, my uh, father is Herbert, my mother is Alice, and of course the last name being Yellen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where Hay Photographers came from. When you mentioned that your dad was doing both the photography and the insurance, was he doing portraiture or was he doing like newspaper? Photography. Well, at that time it was a mix. Uh, predominantly, he was more into the commercial and, and, and product and the photography, mm -hmm. or going out and covering events. Uh, it went into uh, weddings. Uh, out of weddings, when I went into the business, uh, I got more into the portrait end of the photography, along with the weddings and uh, little uh, into the commercial end. Uh, but today, uh, Robert has gone on into the digital end of photography, 
And if it was up to me, it would have gone right over my head with the digital, mm. because uh, you have to be uh, digitally uh, literate, uh, computer literate, to mm. really do digital photography correctly. When your dad first started this business, was he working from home, or did he have a studio someplace? We had a hall. We had a dark room. In fact, we had a dark room right down in the basement of this house. That's where the first dark room was. Did he have a studio for portraiture sittings, or people? We we had some room down there, which we were able to uh, set up. So he'd put a background up and do portrait sittings, or we would go out and do portrait sittings at a home on location. Mm -hmm. uh, but from there, the business got to be big, too big to have at the uh, uh, at the uh, house here, and he rented space. The first space that was rented was in a building uh, right in the center of town, which was a Quintard building. Now the Quintard building, Lester, you would know where this is, uh, is right on the corner of uh, Main and Atlantic Street. Uh, this would be on the, uh, the southeast corner, and some of the businesses that were in that uh, were Bloomfield's Delicatessen, which was downstairs, a G&G &G shoe repair, the old Central News around the corner, yeah. uh, the Beverly Shop, yeah, the Coney Island Restaurant, Brown's Jewelers, the... right, Coney Spelke's, Island was down the street. Spelky Shoe Store was... Right, yeah. Spelky was up the street a little bit. Anyway. Yeah, and Grants was there. And Grants was the there, Grants right, the Grants five and ten, ten. Yeah. That's correct. And it was right across the street from where the Veterans Memorial was, and that was in a little park called Central Park. And it was uh, sort of a triangle where um, if you were coming uh, west on Main Street, it would shoot off up to Park Row, or it would go straight on Main Street, and uh, the other part of the park would be Atlantic Street coming down so, uh, north and south. And the uh, old uh, War Memorial uh, was located right in that park. Now they have changed that memorial uh, to a lot of marble uh, statues yeah. also. But it still remains uh, the War Memorial for the World War II. Where was the next move after Quintard building? Uh, in 1965, uh, we had a fire. There was a fire. The building was destroyed. I remember uh, it was right uh, the night of Rosh Hashanah, and we were called by the, the police that the building was on fire. And uh, we had a total loss, and the fire was so hot that the negatives being plastic or a plastic base, uh, it was so hot that uh, the negatives literally melted in the file cabinets. So our greatest loss was a 20-year file of negatives that we'd accumulated from various events such as weddings and mm -hmm. events of that type. From there, we went. Uh, the studio uh, went down and found a, a space in uh, Milton Sarner's building, uh, which was on the corner of uh, Cottage Street and Atlantic Street, across from the old Stanford Theater and the old YMCA. And uh, we were there for about uh, 10 years, uh, 10 years, I guess it was, uh, let's see, 1965 to 1976. This and was up on the second floor, bro. No, this was in a downstairs store location. The street level? Yep, this was the old first, <coughs> the, the Saunders had their store there before they moved up the street. Uh, and we took over uh, Sonner's store, who Milton Sonner was still the owner of the building. And we took over that store. And at that time, Stanford was in the middle of urban renewal. And that becoming one of the urban renewal uh, projects, uh, we had to find space. And we found a space in, uh, across the street in a building uh, that went up but did not have tenants at that time. It was part of the St. John's uh, urban apartment uh, project. 
That's when they built the towers. That's when they built the towers. And when they built the towers, they uh, put these stores out on Atlantic Street frontage. Uh, and uh, for uh, probably to service uh, more of the tenants of those buildings along with other tenants of Stanford. As they still have stores now uh, on the downstairs part of the apartments on Washington Boulevard. Uh, and uh, we were there for about 20 years. And when the possibility of that building being sold, uh, they uh, made arrangements uh, for us to move out, and we moved into our current location, which was in Glenbrook, on Glenbrook Road. And that's where the studio is presently. Are you still active in the business? <coughs> yes, I am still. I still go into work. I open up every day, and uh, I guess I've heard arguments both ways. Why haven't you retired? Why haven't you moved to Florida? You know, uh, enjoy life a little bit. But uh, I guess this keeps me going. It gives me something to get up for in the morning, and uh, it gives me something to do. It's a tough boss I've got now, but uh, you put up with things. <laughs> so Robert is now a third generation of hay photographers. Robert's third generation. And, and what is primarily, what is the business, is it, uh, what's the biggest source of revenue now? Well, Robert has stayed into the, uh, the, the business as a portrait photographer. Weddings, bar mitzvahs of that type, mm -hmm. events of that type. We do some corporate events. And uh, he's taken, he's, of course, as I said before, he transferred into this digital photography uh, today. And uh, he's, he's running with the ball very well. Uh, with the economy and everything else being in a, in a tremendous downturn now, for anybody to stay in business, it's difficult. So, but he's holding on to what he can and doing the best with it. So far, it's uh, he's still there. <laughs> so, uh, when did you serve time in the uh, Signal Corps? I, I was uh, inducted into the service. I was drafted during the Korea uh, draft, and I was drafted in March of 1952. And I was in the service for two years, and this was probably. Uh, one of the most entertaining parts of my life, beside, well, I, you know, I skipped on. At that point, uh, I, being drafted, I was uh, at that time seeing Barbara, my wife. Her maiden name was Barbara Sherman. Where did you meet Barbara? I met Barbara at the JCC, at, the, at that time, the Jewish Center on Prospect Street. And we were involved uh, in our late teen years. Uh, in the various youth organizations, uh, the AZA, I was a past president of AZA, and you remember that, I believe you were at AZA also, and, uh, and Barbara was in the Young Judea and uh, Girls Group and uh, in other organizations, and the, and the Stanford uh, JCC at that time had uh, during school vacations, they had what they called intercommunity days, where we interacted with other Jewish uh, centers in the state, going up to New London, Bridgeport, and we used to travel back and forth during these school holidays and have events with other communities. And one of the intercommunity days I was planned uh, to be held at the Stanford Jewish Center. Barbara and I were on the committees uh, planning various events for housing and uh, other uh, events for that inter-community event. And that's how we started uh, seeing each other and got to know each other. Was Barbara a Stanford person? Or? Yeah, she's a native born also. Mm -hmm. uh, her parents was Herb and Lillian Sherman. And uh, uh, Lillian Sherman, uh, her maiden name was Epstein, and there was quite a large Epstein community in Stanford 
also. We can get into that or we can uh, hopefully get Barbara to do an interview in the future and she can get into that. Well, let's uh, back up a moment. When you were in the Signal Corps, what were you doing? I, well, where were you stationed? When I was in the Signal Corps, when I went into the service, uh, I got a letter from uh, the editor of the Stanford Advocate. Uh, given my qualifications as a photographer. Now, it's very rarely that uh, you would get into doing something in the service that you did as a civilian. Uh, usually, if you were uh, a photographer, you might end up as a baker in the uh, service or some other weird uh, combination of uh, professions. But I was lucky, uh, I had a couple of letters, one from Harry Rosenbaum and one from Ed McCullough, the editor and the advocate, which I brought with me for when I was inducted. And these papers followed me to a point when I got out of basic uh, training, which I was, did my basic training at Fort Gordon in Georgia. They sent me back up to Fort Monmouth in New Jersey, which was a Signal Corps uh, school training base. And uh, they put me into the photo division, but I had to learn photography now, the, the Army way. And I, that stuck with me. Uh, after going through their school session for about four months, uh, Barbara and I decided that we were going to get married. Now that's a story because uh, when you're in the pipeline of basic training, and that basic training includes the, 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 the marching, the firing of weapons, etc., and also your schooling, it's usually about a 16-week period. And uh, once you uh, are in the basic training, they say you're in pipeline. And once you're in pipeline, you cannot get any uh, leaves for any purpose uh, at all. When I got up to my school part of my basic training at Fort Monmouth, where Barbara and I had already been seeing each other for quite a while, and uh, we decided that we were going to plan on getting married. Uh, I said, well, I don't know if, if uh, they'll be, permit me to do that. Being I'm still in my basic training until I found out in my orientation book when I went to Fort Monmouth there was all kinds of explanations of what Fort Monmouth the base is, what's permitted, what isn't permitted and I noticed in part of that booklet that reasons for emergency furlough and one of the reasons was marriage so I got a little loophole there I brought this to my commanding officer, and he was stunned by this, <laughs> and he said, uh, well, let me check into this. He had to go up to the commanding general of the base to get an okay to get me married. <laughs> but uh, we did uh, get married in August of 1952. And where were you married? We were married, uh, at, uh, we were married by Rabbi David Perman at Temple Bethel. Mm -hmm. Uh, we could not uh, plan a large wedding, uh, but we were married in his study, and we had a small dinner for both families. At that time, uh, the, uh, the place was called Brockton Manor. Now, Brockton Manor was sort of an inn restaurant. It was located on Bedford Street, right behind the Congregational Church. Uh, we had a 10-day honeymoon, we went up through upstate New York, Niagara Falls, and then when I came back, I got my orders to ship out uh, to the Far East. I was got my orders to be shipped out to, at that time, we never knew if we were going to end up, most of the fellows were going to Korea because Korea conflict was going on at that time. Uh, but I did get the 10-day furlough, and at that time, Barbara had graduated nursing. She went to the Mount Sinai Hospital School of Nursing. In the three years, 
And part of that three years is when I was beginning in the service. And uh, so when I was uh, shipped overseas, she had begun her profession as a nurse at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital here in Stanford and also Stanford Hospital. And I was overseas for about a year and a half. Now, being a photographer, Anytime you have a camera in your hands and you're in the service, everybody is, wants to have their picture taken. Now, I was a private in the service. At, uh, I eventually made it up to corporal. But uh, I was taking pictures uh, in my position of all the command positions and uh, uh, for a good part of my time in, in Japan, where I was stationed, I was lucky to be pulled out when I arrived in Japan, where most of the fellows that I went with went to Korea. The, event, the outfit that I was assigned to uh, was overrun in Korea, the 71st Signal. The photography group that was over there uh, were shooting with cameras instead of guns, unfortunately, and they were uh, pr pretty much decimated. And they had to bring the unit back to Japan to be uh, to be reestablished with numbers and photographers to uh, uh, do the photography, and it became the Far East Signal Service Battalion, which covered all photography in the uh, anywhere from Alaska uh, through uh, Japan, uh, Korea, any part of the Pacific. Everything was filtered back to our organization there. But I also, being there, I was taking pictures on assignment many, uh, many times of uh, field grade officers. Uh, one of the uh, one of the generals that I was uh, taking pictures of, quite frankly, was Mark Clark, General Mark Clark, and uh, he and his wife were both over there. Uh, Mark Clark was Commanding General of the Far East uh, Command. His wife uh, did a lot of service visiting troops that were wounded and brought back from Korea and that were at the Tokyo Army Hospital. And we were always taking pictures of her visiting these various troops so they could send pictures home to their families. What type of equipment? Were you using f for your camera? Everything was done with at that time with a speed graphic. Uh, you might not remember what the speed graphic was, but uh, the front page of the New York News mm -hmm. always had a little square thing image mm -hmm. on the top of their uh, page, and mm -hmm. which was representative of the speed graphic because the news was a predominantly in a picture newspaper at the time. So when you came back home way after discharge. You're now married. Where did you live? Uh, when I came back home, we lived, uh, we got an apartment at Woodside Village. Uh, at that time, uh, it was a very uh, fair rental uh, apartment, but... Uh, fair rental by law, or you just... No, it was fair rental, hmm. not by law, and just one of the places that you could get an apartment and afford to live hmm. as a young couple. What, do you remember what the rent was? Yeah, I believe uh, the, the rent at that time was $72 a month. Was that one bedroom, two bedroom? That was a one bedroom mm -hmm. apartment, three room, called three room yeah. apartment. Uh, the only thing is, uh, they were so popular, you had to wait in line to get your apartment. And uh, the only way you could get an apartment is to uh, spend a little something under the table uh, to uh, the manager of the apartments uh, to put your name up mm -hmm. higher on the list. Uh, but that was a foregone conclusion at the time, and, mm -hmm. and you, you played the game. Uh, from uh, there, we went on to uh, move to a Fairlawn Apartments. And the Fairlawn Apartments are still existing today, which are now condominiums. And from the Fairlawn Apartments, after being there about three years, uh, we moved into uh, our uh, the family house right here in Kane Avenue. 
when my parents moved out into a, an apartment, they were downsizing and we were building our family. So, Did you have any children by the time you moved in? Yes, we had uh, at that time uh, two, three children. And what are their names? Uh, my oldest son is Scott, my second son is Craig, and my daughter is Bonnie. And then when we moved here, when we moved here, uh, we have had a third son, Robert. Julie? I'm kind of frog in my throat today. Well, good afternoon, Arnold. Uh, thank you for being a participant in our oral history project. Uh, how long have you lived in Stanford, Arnold? All my life, native. You're a native. You're one of the. I'm one of Jacob Nemoyton's babies. One of the select few. That's right. Uh, Arnold, uh, you were born when? May 6, 1930. And where were your parents living at the time? Uh, in Cold Spring Road. I don't know, they don't remember the name, the number. But I do remember uh, I grew up in my initial years on Cold Spring Road. And uh, from there, moved on to uh, Forest Lawn Avenue, which is a bit literally around the corner from there. And uh, you want me to progress on? Well, the uh, places you lived in obviously were private homes because we didn't have condominiums back then that I can recall. That's right. Uh, we moved from, uh, when we moved to uh, Forest Lawn Avenue, uh, I remember my grandmother lived there and I believe uh, she helped my parents purchase that house. And uh, being a single woman, she, of course, lived uh, with us in that house. You mentioned your grandmother. Was that uh, your mother's mother or your dad's mother? That was my mother's mother. Uh, it was Frances Ross. And uh, she was quite an involved woman in the city also, uh, working for many, many years with Mantella Martin uh, clothiers in Stanford. As a salesperson? As a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And th did she, uh, where was she born? In Latvia. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, the name, the country name that came up during conversation. Uh, but uh, she never got into that too much. Mm -hmm. I know uh, she came to this country and uh, uh, lived in Yonkers. Well, how did she uh, get get here? What, did, did she have relatives here or she...? Yes, uh, no, she didn't have relatives here, but uh, uh, she came... Uh, that's a little uh, unclear for me at this point. Uh, I remember uh, my recollection from family history is that she came uh, with my uh, mother from Yonkers, where uh, my father originally also was from Yonkers, and that's how they became friendly, coming from the same general area of New York. Uh, we did locate some history through Ellis Island uh, inquiries, uh, but not much on my grandmother, more on my wife's side. Was she married when she came here? From Latvia? Uh, she was not married. She was a single woman at that mm -hmm. time. And then she did get married, and the marriage uh, did not last that long, but it did last long enough uh, for my uh, mother to come out of the marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of her uh, becoming a single woman after that, that's why that she became living. She lived with us uh, at the Forest Lawn Avenue uh, address. And also, she lived at this current home, which they owned eventually before I took ownership of it. 
Uh, and matter of fact, she, uh, her last years, uh, she was living in this home. In this home? Yes. Hmm. So she never remarried. She remained a single person for the rest of her life. Yeah, she became a Ms. Yeah. <laughs> and a professional woman. <laughs> and how about uh, your dad's parents? Did you know them? Were they... Yes, uh, I didn't know them, no. Uh, but he came out of Yonkers uh, and immigrated to this country from uh, what is at that time was uh, Poland, but it was right close to uh, Russia, Bielostok, Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could have been uh, Russia one, one week and Poland the next week. It was right on the border, back and forth with all the fighting that was going on. But originally, before that, the Yellen family uh, immigrated uh, many, many years ago out of Israel. And uh, even today, uh, the name goes back in, in Israel, there is a David Yellen University which is a teacher's college. And uh, if you look up uh, through uh, internet and uh, if you Google it, you, the Ellen seem to have a, quite a, uh, a long history that goes back to Israel. Israel, uh, there are four brothers, I believe, that traveled uh, from country to country uh, through Europe and eventually went to uh, ended up in Poland, and when, of course, the problems in Poland and Russia, and at that time, uh, the pogroms that were going on, uh, they uh, traveled, three of the brothers, I believe, traveled to this country. Uh, there's one, I believe, that uh, went on to Chicago. There's one yelling, I think, that settled in the... Uh, Pennsylvania area, and of course the Yellen that settled in the New York area, which is my direct descendant, and he settled in Yonkers, and uh, became a butcher in Yonkers, and was one of the founders of one of the uh, current uh, temple congregations in Yonkers. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, he had, uh, I think it was one daughter and uh, three sons, four sons. Uh, the daughter died at a young age, and uh, those four sons, which were uh, Herbert, Wynne, Abbott, and there was one other that didn't, didn't make it that died at a young age. Mm -hmm. Do you think the name was always Yellen or did they shorten it when it came to this country? It was always Yellen, but it wasn't spelled as my name is spelled with one L, Y-E-L-I-N. Originally, the original spelling was with two L's, Y-E-L-L-I-N. And if you're a current listener of, uh, even today of... Uh, CNN, you know, there's a commentator, uh, a young woman on there now, yes. Jessica Yellen, yes. which is one of our descendants somewhere down the line. Uh -huh. Don't ask me how. The uh, Philadelphia contingent right now, uh, or originally, uh, were artisans in the ironworks and have quite a name for themselves in uh, projects that they have completed. Uh, in New York metropolitan area, uh, there's quite a few uh, projects. Uh, but every time I see a Yellen and I get to speak to them, I'll ask them if they know where their relatives came from. And sure enough, in conversation, they mm -hmm. all filtered back from that uh, uh, Polish uh, heritage area. Yeah. When you were uh, school age, now were you living on Cold Spring Road or when you had already moved? I had, I had moved, I had started uh, school from the Forest Lawn Avenue address. Yeah. 
Now, what school did you attend? I time? attended Franklin School on Franklin Street, which is now the YWCA, I believe. And uh, I remember that I started school with my kindergarten teacher being uh, Mrs. Shannon, or Miss Shannon. And uh, she had a uh, helper, Miss Lamb, at the time, uh, sort of a teaching assistant, I guess. And I grew right up through uh, Wood School to, at that time, through the elementary years, which was up to sixth grade. Right at that time, uh, my family, and this was going back to 1942, moved into this current house, uh, Kane Avenue here. And uh, I continued my education at Willard School, which is directly across the street from the house. And I did my, at that time, my junior high school uh, education, which was at that time the 7th, 8th, and included ninth grade at Willard School before going on to Stanford High School. Mm -hmm. Did you have any siblings at the time? Yeah, I had uh, a sister that uh, was older than me, Phyllis, and she was born uh, in the Colesbury Road address. Uh, but she uh, developed a, uh, a strep infection when she was nine years old and passed away. And uh, that hit me quite hard at the time because I was being prepared uh, that Phyllis was going to help me out, get, bring me to school every day, and, uh, and then all of a sudden Phyllis wasn't there. And it was a little bit traumatic uh, for me to start school, and uh, I believe I was a crier at the time, and and now I haven't stopped crying. <laughs> was it, was it uh, something that was prevalent throughout the, the school system, or people that age, or uh, no? Was she just... had she had fallen. Uh, uh, I believe she was riding down the, the Forest Lawn Avenue hill and she, in a wagon and she fell and scraped her arm. And from a little scrape, uh, it developed into this strep infection. And she passed away two weeks before the sulfonilamide drug was invented, which would have saved her life. And uh, tying back to Dr. Nemoyne, she was also a, a Jake Nemoyne child. He sat with her to the time she passed away in one of the paintings that he has left to our community. Somewhere is a picture of her lying in a hospital bed receiving yeah. with all tubes and everything else. I've seen that painting. Yes. yes. Uh, this is one that uh, he had painted up her. And uh, it was quite, it was not only uh, a shock to a uh, family, of course, but it was a shock to the whole Jewish community knowing the family at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, with uh, God's blessing, uh, my parents were uh, honored with another daughter, Jared Geraldine, and she was born in 1937. Uh, this was two years after Phyllis had passed away. And uh, Geraldine, uh, Jerry, my sister, who married Stuart Witt, and uh, they moved to Florida and she also passed away at an early age of 41 from breast cancer. And uh, of course, uh, going through it once as a parent is difficult. Uh, to have to go through it twice is unimaginable. And uh, there isn't too much you can say about that other than things that they're learning about this disease now. Uh, my niece, uh, Cherry's daughter, Phyllis, who was named after my first sister, uh, 
almost to the day in the same age of life developed breast cancer also, but with the things that they have learned in the medicine uh, on, on how to treat it, thank God she is a survivor doing very well today. That's, that's nice to hear when people survive. Well, we were talking about your uh, photography while you were in the service. Yeah, yeah. And did you meet any interesting people when, or photograph them when you were on yeah. assignment? The uh, one that stands out, uh, well, we're always doing uh, hometown releases. And there were always, uh, there was somebody coming in from the States uh, all the time to do a movie. Uh, one of the movies uh, that was photographed over there was Bridges of Tokiri and uh, some of the nightclub uh, uh, shots uh, that were done where there's a nightclub there in, in Tokyo and that's when uh, uh, Earl Holloman, Mickey Rooney, William Holden were in that movie. And of course, what was I doing there? I had to go down and meet them because they used a lot of service people in the nightclub uh, shot so I had to take hometown release pictures again similar to the ones I took in the hospital with General Clark's wife and uh, the army would uh, send these hometown release photos back to their hometown papers because they were they had their five minutes of fame in the nightclub uh, mm -hmm. scenes of the movie and uh, it was there was I met got to meet a lot of people uh, one uh, special event, uh, and being a Yankee fan, of course, uh, for many years, uh, and I'll get back into that, that's the latter part of my life, uh, but uh, one of the special events that uh, happened was Joe DiMaggio uh, married Marilyn Monroe, if you think back. This was uh, back in the 1950s, back in, I think it was 1953. And it was noted that he was going to go on his honeymoon uh, to Japan with Marilyn Monroe. That's where they were going to uh, do their honeymoon trip. And uh, not only them, but they had a third member of their party because uh, Lefty O'Doul uh, went with them. Uh, Lefty O'Doul was a baseball player and he was a good friend of uh, Joe. And uh, so that was a sort of menage a trois or something. I, I don't know, but uh, when it happened, I had heard that they were coming over and I got uh, their flight arrival. And I rigged an assignment. When you rig an assignment, you put something together that was not officially sanctioned by the Army in order to get a vehicle to go down to uh, where this event was going to take place and you were taking pictures of it. So I rigged this assignment to go down to Tokyo uh, Airport, which was Haneda Airport, which was between Tokyo and Yokohama, and meet the arrival of the honeymoon couple who came in on this Pan American flight. Uh, and I took pictures of this uh, event, of them arriving. Uh, and Japan was very, very conscious of, of two things. One was baseball, of course, being baseball, going uh, back to Babe Ruth when Babe Ruth went over there on trips. And also Marilyn Monroe or as they called her, Mala <laughs> And uh, so consequently, their arrival uh, uh, brought out a, uh, th a huge throng of uh, fans, both baseball and Marilyn Monroe fans. And I was a photographer down there amongst maybe 50 other photographers. And uh, I had a little bit of uh, insight as to what might happen. At that time, the strata liners for Pan Am were uh, you uh, deplaned on these strata liners on by uh, stairs, which was sort of a two deck stairs. They came down one deck and then they came down another deck because it was such a huge plane at that time. 
But the throng of people were crushing around the bottom of these stairs so much that they <laughs> couldn't bring her out of the stairs. She would have been crushed by the throng. So after waiting about a half hour, I suspected something was going on. I saw this jeep pull up underneath the plane. Yeah, underneath the strata cruisers, they had the escape hatches for uh, emergencies. And they brought her down through the bottom of the plane and opened up the escape hatch and she just stepped down into this jeep where they drove her off. And I got pictures of her stepping down to the, the jeep and all her arrival. Uh, I followed her back to, at that time, the Imperial Hotel, which was one of the nicer hotels in Tokyo, and gained access uh, to her being a U.S. Army photographer mm -hmm. again. Uh, and having that camera in my hand, uh, and her being a publicity person, and I continued taking pictures uh, of her uh, with various facets of uh, her uh, visit to uh, Japan on her honeymoon. Well, the uh, Army caught a hold of these pictures. They made the assignment, an official assignment now, uh, promising, and they went up to her, approached her, and they said, if you will go over to Korea, to entertain the troops, or to see the troops, we will give you a complete distribution back in the States of this picture story. And uh, Joe didn't want any part of it. He is not a publicity type person. He's more of a private person. But she couldn't turn down this publicity. She agreed to uh, go to Korea, and she did. And uh, in order to go over to Korea at that time, being a hot war zone, she had to have a picture taken for her Geneva Convention card. So she, they brought, she was having her hair done. There was a hairdressing salon at the Tokyo Army Hospital. And they arranged for me to go up to meet her after she had her hair done. And they brought her into the commanding officer's office there. And I took her picture, uh, that's how I met her, face to face at that time. And uh, we were talking, you know, having not been home for a while, you know, what's going on back in the States, what's new, this and that. And you know, we were talking very casually, just like you or I. She was not that uh, type of person that was, uh, she was brought on to be uh, because of her star celebrity. Uh, she was a nice, if anything, more or less laid-back uh, type person. And we talked for about a half hour or more uh, about different things. The bottom line is, when you're in the service, you never saw the pictures that you, you took. It always went back through channels and eventually ended up back in Pentagon. You never did any processing then? You I just... never did any processing. I was strictly a shooter. So the cut film went out? That's right. It was it was processed there, but it went back to the uh, the headquarters. Mm -hmm. When I got back out of the service, Barbara and I uh, took a sort of delayed honeymoon, and we took a two month trip around the country, and it was about fifteen thousand miles. And uh, I remember that we were out in Wenatchee, Washington. This sticks out in my mind. Something like this doesn't uh, you don't lose this. And Barbara stopped into a drugstore at the time, picked up a movie magazine to, to read. And when she opened up the magazine and showed it to me, she, there was this whole coverage of pictures that I had taken, the spread that the Army promised her publicity on. And there's a whole spread of pictures in this magazine. I didn't get a credit on it, it was a U.S. Army photo. But uh, that's one of the high points uh, of that. And. Uh, uh, a tail end story which just happened a year or two ago, we were taking pictures at the uh, ROTC Ball, which the West Hill High School here in town has an RCT program, and they had uh, this ball in March, and we were taking pictures of their ball for them at the Italian Center. And in the middle of their festivities, they called me into the ballroom. I had talked to the Major, who was the commanding officer of the ROTC program uh, in previous years, and we had talked about various Army stories come up, 
and how, what did I do when I was in the service, etc. And, uh, and I told him different things that I was doing and one of the things that I had done was this Marilyn Monroe story. And uh, he says, that's funny, he says, I've got that picture that you took of her. When you were discharged, did they let you take, take your speed graphic press camera back home with No, you? no, no. The, uh, I don't know if I want it because uh, everything when you go in the service, you know, uh, is, is khaki. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, my speed graphic camera was khaki in color. Oh, really? <laughs> so I wanted to forget the khaki at that point. But getting back to Maryland and this ROTC program, uh, I never heard from the commander regarding the story that he said he had this picture of her until the following year, which is about uh, say a year and two years ago. During their ball, they called me into the auditorium during their festivities, and they presented me with a plaque with the original Geneva Convention, the Army copy of the Geneva Convention card with the picture that I had taken of Marilyn uh, that she used to go to Korea on. And they presented it to me, and so that picture had come full circle at that point. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I saw the picture, as a matter of fact. Uh, and she had signed the card, and I still have that uh, plaque now, and you can see when she signed the card, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, Marilyn, I think it was Jean DiMaggio, because it was, she had just been married. That was her married name at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was able, luckily, I was away from the shooting of the Korea event. Mm -hmm. uh, I covered enough events where I've seen enough of the uh, casualties of Korea uh, to keep your head straight. But I was lucky enough to be away from the actual fighting. And, of course, my family was uh, happy with that, that I wasn't uh, near the, the shooting, as you can imagine. Uh, but we did get back, and uh, Barbara, when I was taking the picture, one more point, which is very funny at the time, and this goes back in history, because at that time, uh, in the 50s, uh, women were decorating uh, uh, their faces uh, with uh, artificial moles. This, they paste on a mural and it's a decorative uh, item or something. When I was taking pictures, this picture I took for the convention card for uh, Marilyn, she was wearing a low neck dress, beautiful low neck, v neck dress. And I had noticed that uh, at that time she had dual moles, one on each bosom. And uh, of course, being a red blooded American male, you notice these things. Uh, but I, I just ignored it as just uh, probably something she's using to decorate uh, with these molds. When I get back, I went to a movie with Barbara at the Palace Theater. It was one of these uh, uh, ultra musicals uh, where Marilyn Monroe was in this, and she came out in this uh, movie scene in a uh, low neck evening gown. And sure enough, uh, there were these two moles that I noticed, and I just blurted out in the middle of the theater, my God, they're real. And everybody looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> but it's one of the funny uh, parts of a life uh, that you go through. And some of the uh, experiences that I have had being a part of the Army were good experiences, not necessarily uh, bad. Well, now that... Uh I don't know if you call yourself semi-retired or part-time engaged in working. Semi-retired. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other leisure activities that uh, you find well, I'm very, pr I'm very proud to have been associated with the uh, Jewish Historical Society. When it was originally the Stanford Jewish Historical Society, uh, George Goldberg, one of the uh, founder of the, of the society, as a matter of fact, got me involved. Uh, and at one time, uh, it was mainly to help them out with photography projects that they had in doing photography. Uh, and uh, 
I've been involved in that for, I, I imagine it's a better part of 15 years about now. Well, the society is 25 years old. I think you've been in longer than 15. It, it might, might have been more than 15 years, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud to count that as one of my uh, achievements in life. Uh, it was, I, I considered it a, a, a blessing to be a part of it, I guess. Uh, uh, because I'm able to do something or as little as I did. I am a past president and but what I see of the what the presidents have been doing in, in recent years uh, uh, my presidency paled in progress from what has been done recently uh, and just sitting here now for this interview uh, I remember back to when Bernie Nemoyton uh, started doing these uh, oral histories and they were sporadic and few between and now it's become such a project run by such a professional team of interviewers uh, uh, it's it just gives a little bit of what the historical society is all about and what it's meant to be it's been a very rewarding uh, project for all of us involved to hear such interesting stories of how people's parents got to this country and the people who, like yourself, were in business or third generation businesses yeah. uh, and how their parents or grandparents arrived in Stanford and for what reason. So uh, we really appreciate the, your input. Uh, we have probably interviewed about 40 people at this point in the video uh, part of this project. Now, you've been in Stanford all your life, yep. and reflecting back now as you were growing up and we would know all the merchants downtown, the merchants knew us and our families, and today we're a very urban community. Yep. What's your take on it? Do you feel that... Uh, we're better for it, or would you prefer that it was like it was when we were growing up? Uh, of course, you're not going to ever replace uh, old-time Stanford. I say old-time Stanford compared to what it is now. Uh, and then you'll find someone that's going to come out and say you couldn't stop progress. Uh, then you're going to find somebody that's going to answer that by saying, why not? Uh, because what we have gained in progress, we have lost in intimacy, I think. Uh, I know my daughter, who remembers old time Stanford, and she is an architectural designer. And when they saw what she saw, what they did with the building of redevelopment in Stanford, she says it's almost like they put out a contest to uh, architects and everybody submitted their own plan uh, for building Stanford up. And it's such a hodgepodge of various designs uh, that she was very, she, she disagreed with it. She laughed at it, as a matter of fact. Has she seen the Trump Tower? She wants tower? to know who won the contest, you know. Uh, but again, you can stop progress. But then again, I, uh, with the progress and the, uh, what we have in Stanford today, I remember my going back to my father when he was with the insurance company and he would walk down Main Street or down Atlantic Street and he would, it would be good morning so and so, good morning so and so, he would know this person, they would know him, Stanford would know each other. Uh, the business of Hay Photographers was built from people native Stanford's uh, people that knew him as an insurance man. And when they had difficult times in paying their premiums, which were uh, nickel and dime and quarter policies, uh, when my father had a debit of uh, the west side and the south end and some of the poorer families, and he would put in these uh, payments, weekly payments of nickels and dimes and quarters where they couldn't afford it until they could. 
to, so they wouldn't have to lapse their policies. These are the people that started Hay Photographers because when he went into business, they remembered Herb Yellen, the photographer, being Herb Yellen, the insurance man that helped them out. At that time, when their children became marriageable age and they were getting married, at that time the families planned the weddings, the children didn't. And they said to their children, well, when it came to photography, you're going to go see Herb Yellen because when he helped us out, now maybe we can help him out in his business. And that's how Hay Photographers really took off and came to be. That's another little story. Yeah, that's a wonderful know. memory. But that's what Stanford used to be. Yeah. And that's what people today will say Stanford isn't necessarily anymore. And uh, you can say it's for the better, for the worse. Everybody will have their own opinion. What is your opinion? My opinion, I've got four children, God bless them, they're, they gave me grandchildren, uh, they're healthy, they grew up in the Stanford, uh, in the flux of its becoming larger, they had uh, education where they were, tr they're, they're, they're being used as guinea pig through their educational years because they were trying the new math or the new history or something new and if they found out uh, that it uh, wasn't necessarily that great they would drop it and it's not something that would be continued and this is part of the things I remember when they were going to school I brought up the question to their teachers is this necessarily better for our local educators to be bringing to our children rather than a, a formed plan of education and uh, again, I'm getting into quasi-politics now, which I don't think this is the forum for. Right. But they're all, they all, despite the challenges in school, they've all done well. Yes, they all did. Uh, mm -hmm. My oldest son, uh, Scott, who uh, up to last year was, uh, he fulfilled uh, probably a, what is mostly a, a childhood dream of a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, he became part of the New York Yankee organization and uh, was doing uh, massage therapy with the Yankees for nine years and had a lot of stories out of that, made a lot of friends. Uh, today Scott is over in Thailand. He's, he's teaching English at a, a university over there, English as a second language. Uh, I have a son, Craig, who is up in West Hartford. And he's developed a, a real safe business up there. My daughter Bonnie, I mentioned, was an architectural designer. And my last son, Robert, took over the business and is running with that now. Mm -hmm. So I have to, can, you know, you, you watch the kids grow up and you're proud of every one of them and what their accomplishments are. And you look back and say then, and first appreciate, that maybe your parents appreciated what you did too. Well, Arnold, it's been a very interesting hour or more. And on behalf of the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County, we want to thank you very much. And we will uh, create a DVD of this interview and present you with a copy for you to share with your Family and uh, I consider enjoy. Lester. I consider this uh, an honor to be a part of this event, uh, especially uh, being interviewed by you, who is also a native of Stanford and has experienced a lot of my experiences. Also, thank you.